For some, it's the cultural phenomenon of a generation. It enjoys great media prominence and support. Even children have got in on the act. Pantomime dames are nothing new to generations of families, but drag queens are. And now, with such widespread recognition, drag queens have entered libraries to teach young children about gender fluidity and to give them positive LGBT role models. Important and inclusive fun, or just dressed up to be? In Western culture, the pantomime dame is tradition, enjoyed by generations of families as harmless, no-nonsense good fun. But in the 21st century, the quaint pantomime dame has been usurped by its more assertive younger sibling, the drag queen. And, not content with staging an impressive takeover of mainstream television, online streaming services, international conventions and reality shows, drag queens have now entered libraries to teach young children about gender fluidity and to give them positive LGBT role models. And some people are not happy about it. This poem is about how lying can sometimes make you feel really bad. I have an issue with Jack green through time on a number of levels. On the first level, as an author, as a poet, um, a good picture book or a good poem is written with great care. The storyteller who tells the story should be the frame. The story is the photo. So storyteller's role is to bring the book to life, not get in the way of the text and the illustrations. Um, now, that might involve a, a prop bag, you know, I've used props um, with, with young children or possibly a little bit of dressing up, but it does not involve a sexualised, hyperbolic parody of a woman. And I think that's inappropriate both for boys and girls. So where did this all originate from? Well, men on stage in outlandish drag makeup is nothing new. Sometimes it was for the theatrics of it, other times because of misogyny. Societies through the ages have replaced women with men on stage from ancient Greece to Japan to works of Shakespeare. And while sexist stereotypes have continued, the drag queens of today are more sexually provocative and about expressing a gender identity. Present day drag queens are recognised under the trans umbrella according to various LGBT lobby groups. They're also recognised as adult entertainment. Certainly, drag performers on the circuit earn their money performing highly sexualised routines and where it is custom, like a stripper, and some of them are strippers as well, to be rewarded with money as they perform. Most people I talked with had no issue with drag queens for adults. Indeed, as we have seen, drag queens as entertainment are phenomenally popular, from mainstream to fringe. But, as children's entertainers, who, you might be wondering, would conceive the idea of taking sexualised drag queens and giving them day jobs reading to 3 to 11 year olds in libraries is quite the creative leap. Ah, that would be American writer and mother Michelle T, whose academic work around queer theory led her to conceiving the idea of men in dresses reading stories about acceptance and gender to small children. Really? I mean, I've worked for 35 years with children. I used to be a preschool special needs assessment teacher. Not once in my whole life have I gone home at night over my cup of tea and thought, I know what that child needs. He needs to see a man dressed up as a woman, catered makeup with sexualized clothing. Michelle T, however, felt completely differently to Rachel Rooney and, in a lesbian relationship and with a young son, felt that library events needed to be more inclusive of LGBT families. And, together with a production company, Drag Queen Storytime was born in a San Francisco library in 2015. Early observers were surprised that such an overtly sexual entertainment form was allowed in the traditionally staid library environment and as entertainment for children. And were it not for Judith Krug, Michelle T's idea may have floundered. Krug, a one-time librarian and before her death in 2009 a leading liberal proponent through her work with ACLU, it was Krug who fought unrelentingly to change what libraries may or may not include on their shelves and in their programmes, and if that involved materials that may be inappropriate for children, so be it. 
Dan Kleiman of the Safe Libraries blog has been concerned about libraries in his native US for two decades and has extensively researched the activities taking place and supported by the American Library Association. He's an outspoken critic of Judith Krug and the policies she enabled. Herself, she changed uh, how the American Library Association would do things. No longer would they protect children from harm. Now they would push it on them and leave it up to their parents to stop it, while at the same time misleading the parents so that the parents can't possibly do it. And this all comes from the ACLU. So it was Michelle T's San Francisco debut led to Drag Queen Story Hour all around the US with the American Library Association having staff meetings and guidance on not only how to run them, but how to overcome resistance. They're training thousands of librarians how to expect opposition from people like me and what to do about it, how to uh, mislead your governments into saying this is a First Amendment right when it's not. So, this internal LGBT activism taking place within libraries in the States has, as might be expected, proven highly successful. Drag Queen Story Hour is now a firm fixture in America, spreading with wild abandon to other countries and becoming as normalised as computers and books. For many commentators, Drag Queen Story Hour being male entertainers is just another way for patriarchy to assert itself over women and children. And, given recent events, it's hard to disagree. At the beginning of 2020, the New York Public Library cancelled a meeting featuring, amongst others, speakers Megan Murphy and Posey Parker. The night was to highlight women who had ironically been cancelled, as modern parlance would have it, merely for attempting to discuss women's rights and in an era where such rights are under attack from the powerful gender lobby. But here's the kicker. The New York Public Library, however, has had no such qualms hosting several Drag Queen Story Hour events. Clearly, the intellectual freedoms that the American Library Association so cherish doesn't extend to all. Dan Kleinman maintains that in America at least, Drag Queen Story Hour is a lawbreaker. For example, in the United States, there are laws that require libraries to act for the use and benefit of the public. Well, Drag Queen Story Hour introduces things to children that makes it so that it is harmful, okay? It's not just reading stories. It's also showing crotches. It's also waving behinds. It's also crawling into the, into the crevices of these, uh, of these people. That's not reading stories. This is harmful things going on. When harmful things are happening in a library, it violates the laws that apply to those libraries. In the UK, the Library Act of 1964 is a vague piece of legislation, but there does exist avenues to legally challenge Drag Queen Story Hour if people so desire. In winter 2019, I ran a poll on Twitter. I asked, do you support Drag Queen Story Time? Of the 14,000 who responded, 88% gave a resounding no, and even then people filled the comments saying they meant to vote no, but it had registered as yes. Nonetheless, the almost 90% were clear and unequivocal about their disdain at the arrival of drag queens teaching small children about gender, and many respondents were forthright and damning in the comments. In fact, such is the passionate opposition to drag queen story hours, it has even experienced its first death. In January 2020, activist Wilson Gavin and his friends protested at a library. A day later, and following social media backlash, Wilson Gavin was dead. It would be easy to write off critics as simply those who are conservative or Christian or homophobic, but that would be misleading. Many traditionally left-wing voices, and I am one of them, have problems with Drag Queen Story Hour beyond politics, beyond sexuality, and beyond ideology. In fact, Wilson Gavin was gay, and neither is he alone from the LGBT community in what, speaking out. What in the hell has a drag queen ever done to make you have so much respect for them and admire them so much? other than put on makeup and, and jump on the floor and writhe around and do sexual things on stage. I have absolutely no idea why you would want that to influence your child. Neither does Kitty Demure think it is helping to create tolerance. 
And honestly, you're not doing the gay community any favors. In fact, you're hurting us, okay? We have already had a reputation of being pedophiles and being perverts and deviants. We don't need you to bring your children around. Shelley Charlesworth is a journalist who's investigated extensively the sexualization of children. The aim is to get children to accept an adult activity that's actually highly sexual. That, I mean, drag is highly sexual. And so you're normalizing it, it within an environment that should be safe and full of things that you can explore and, uh, and form and educate and have fun. But it, what you're doing is bringing a uh, form of adult sexuality into that. And it is also, you have to uh, admit, a place where adults who don't normally have anything to do with children can get closer to children. And I'm afraid historically we know that that always should raise a red flag in the church, in the Boy Scouts or wherever, where adults have shown an, a, a very determined interest in getting closer to children, it usually means that there will be some pedophiles around. Yet, despite opposition in its homeland, including lawsuits filed to try and stop it, Drag Queen Story Hour skipped the Atlantic Ocean and headed to Britain where it began in 2017, with a library here and there. Nothing too grand, and we Brits called it Drag Queen Story Time rather than Hour. One such library in the southwest of England was contacted prior to the event by a number of concerned residents and whose fears were dismissed as the event went ahead, not once but on repeat occasions. And this is who performed a twerking drag queen called Mama G. And then you just move your bum up and down like that, and that's twerking. For the last year and a half, I've received correspondence from a parent who's also a teacher who appealed to local politicians and the library body in Somerset. She asked them to reconsider their decision to book Drag Queen Storytime. She received several responses. This one from Tabitha Witherick, a service delivery manager for Somerset Libraries, echoed a familiar theme. It said, we believe hosting events such as this helps to promote inclusivity and tolerance and helps to deliver stories that explore the sense of self and promote positive mental health. But where did she get this idea from that drag queen story time would promote positive mental health? Certainly there are no studies to back this up. These libraries are making it up as they go along and using the same words which librarians the world over are instructed to use. These words are designed to silence questions and to make people feel bad about daring to ask in the first place. Yes, they are diversity, tolerance, acceptance, inclusion, words that in the 21st century have been used not to right the wrongs, but to cover up all manner of questionable and nefarious behaviour. My source asked me to hide her identity. As a teacher, she's concerned that she would be portrayed as some kind of phobic for objecting to drag queen story time, and she cannot risk the impact that would have on her income in these days where people can literally be fired for stating biological truths. And as the rapid growth of the LGBT lobby group captured institutions all around the UK and Drag Queen Storytime quickly became the event to prove LGBT worthy credentials for local councils, Rochdale in the north of England announced that they too would be hosting a Drag Queen Storytime event. Rochdale, sadly, has an inglorious past regarding failures in child safeguarding and the systematic abuse of children. As a journalist who has extensively investigated child abuse and the sexualisation of them, I was interested to see if Rochdale Council had learned any great lessons from past failures. A reminder, Rochdale officials allowed raping gangs to go untouched because of politically correct fears, as indeed Cyril Smith, the deceased Member of Parliament for Rochdale, who not only abused children in Rochdale's residential care, but he did it with the support of politicians, police and the secret services who all covered for him. Yes, that Rochdale. The safeguarding blurb on Rochdale's council website is all very worthy, but words are cheap. Question is, does it bear up to scrutiny? 
No, it doesn't. Sexual abuse, as they correctly note, may include non-contact activities which are inappropriate or may involve grooming. Both charges have been levelled at Drag Queen Storytime by critics around the world. There is also the issue of whether children can actually consent to being subject to Drag Queen Storytime. After all, children cannot legally consent, so these are adult decisions being foisted upon impressionable young minds. And a big bad puppy. <laughs> and that's what really gets me, is other people taking advantage of children. And that's just wrong for them to do that. And we all know that, but it's not politically correct to say that. One Rochdale resident, realising the child safeguarding issues attached to Drag Queen Storytime, decided to tackle the council officials about it. Stee, a father of three, regularly used the library with his family. He's anonymous here because, like the teacher from the South West, this northern father is fearful of retribution. I wrote a letter to the council in opposition to it on the grounds that it is wholly inappropriate to introduce children to the concept of drag which is a adult sexual entertainment act. Further to that, when I researched who the hired drag queen was, I discovered he has a website on which the very thumbnail for is a photograph of himself on stage wearing BDSM gear in heels. Now on that website, he has a link to his public Instagram page, which contains numerous naked photos of himself and videos of his own sexual performances on stage. Yeah, it's your oh, it's my guy. Um, it's not the daytime, so we're not getting a day bus. Yes, that's right, it's the night time, so let's all get on the night bus! Oh, the irony of Rochdale's advice about children's entertainers. I forward all of these links in my letter to the council explainer that the hiring of this act is a failure of the council safeguarding duties because the children that they are presenting this act with as some sort as a quote an lgbt role model those children who are impressionable may go and search this act for themselves online and come across the same website that i did very easily it, well, actually, it's worse. It's not just if the child happens to look up the drag queen. Okay, Sometimes these public libraries are recommending or linking to the drag queens. In response to my letter, which was addressed to the chief executive of the council, the council leader, my MP and my local councillor, all of them who have read my letter, um, they had the libraries and customer services manager respond to me and effectively fob me off. Um, she said that we aim to be as inclusive as, as possible, as well as diverse and thought provoking, and that the event is extremely popular. Um, she also said that uh, they follow strict safeguarding protocols. Well, I've just highlighted how they failed in doing that because of because they're connecting children very closely to sexually explicit content through the act that they've presented to them as a children's entertainer. I find it absolutely disgusting. After Steve's lack of success with Rochdale Council and the local politicians, I followed up by emailing the same people. I received a weak response from Danny Brierley, Rochdale's head of communications. I responded that there was more for him and Rochdale to answer to, that just because he and his colleagues didn't have a problem with Drag Queen story time, it certainly didn't mean that others' concerns should be treated as mere inconveniences to railroad. Danny Brierley, possibly the least effective communications manager in living history, responded by blocking me on Twitter. Clearly, Rochdale officials are not interested in public concerns, although they did inform me in a Freedom of Information request that they had no current plans for a further Drag Queen story time. I wanted to give the night bus an opportunity to respond and I reached out with a series of questions about his suitability as a children's entertainer. He chose not to respond. For his library gig, he read I'm a Girl by Yasmin Ishmael. It's about a little girl who just wants to be her loud, boisterous self, but people keep stereotyping her as a boy. 
On its own, that's great. Little boys and girls need to be encouraged to break beyond gender stereotypes. Where the message becomes mixed and confusing for children is that the book is read by a man who children are told is a woman, even though the children can clearly see he's not. And then you have to wonder just what is the purpose of drag queen story time and who is it really serving? Um, yeah, I'd like to know why um, adult um, male adult entertainers actually want to read stories to primary age children. What, what's, uh, what's the connection there? Why, why are they so interested in educating little kids suddenly? Because this, this is springing up. There are projects all over the world suddenly um, drag queen story time and I can't help but think that it's just another way of confusing children or making children feel not confident of saying who is a man and who is a woman and being able to distinguish between men and women because the gender identity teaching already makes them feel nervous because some boys are girls and some girls are boys and the drag queen um, just seems to me to be part of that. That's one more way of making a child not feel quite confident to say that's that's a man. Who was reading the story for us? Journalist Shelley Charlesworth has written extensively about the No Outsiders programme in British schools and which the Night Bus and others base their performance on. She has this to say. And I think Drag Queen Storytime is part of that whole push to confuse children and to confuse children then also about sex um, and whether sex is important and whether you should even ask about sex. So... Uh, a really large adult male in a dress, they're being told to call this person, oh, I don't know, Doreen or Lolita or whatever they, their drag name is, and refer to them as she. My name is Blackberry. I'm a bearded drag queen. That means I'm a lady with lots of facial hair. Do you want to touch my hair? No. If you want to be magnanimous and, and uh, a social justice warrior, why are we getting disabled people in, elderly people in, I'm quite happy to get butch women in or effeminate men, you know, that, that's fine, I, I'm all up for smashing the stereotype, but drag, really? So, despite the allegations and controversies, drag queens as we have seen are a seemingly unstoppable force. In the UK, the national broadcasts of the BBC have platformed drag queens extensively and in a non-questioning, highly public relations manner, including, most contentiously for some, that of drag kid Desmond Napoles. Desmond is amazing, his stage name is the obvious manifestation of a child being deeply influenced by the culture of drag queens and some of what we have witnessed has been disturbing. What? See. Bella right. Noche putting the P in LGBT P plus. What has this world come to? It's come to a world where drag kids actually exist. And people do ketamine on a couch. <sighs> but it was his association with convicted murderer Michael Alleg that proved too much for many people. The crimes of Michael Alleg are unnecessarily grotesque to repeat here. Needless to say, he wouldn't be on the list of most 11-year-olds, but when Desmond was asked who he admired and who he wanted to meet, Alec was on that list. Although, as Desmond noted, it wasn't that other side of Alec that he liked. There's a cognitive disconnection that is being fed to children around drag queens, and that is this idea that people can divorce themselves from areas of their life, like murder, like porn, like public nudity, to present as a type of caked up Mary Poppins for the kiddies. But life doesn't work like that. We shouldn't be sending such confusing messages to children. Shelley Charlesworth worked for a decade on the BBC News Channel and knowing the wide-reaching influence of the broadcaster, she was deeply concerned enough to send her former employer a letter about Desmond appearing on the channel with no question of his welfare appropriately addressed. When Michael Alley chose to interview this poor child who clearly um, looks and behaves as if he is uh, autistic and places him under this poster which it shows a little girl with a skipping rope and the word rohypnol. It is 
unbelievable that nobody would find that uh, something that they ought to investigate. I sent that image to the BBC. They are meant to be journalists making this BBC Minute programme. They have absolutely no curiosity whatsoever to investigate, or they're just doubling down, or they are totally already true believers of a kind of um, gender identity theory, and they want to push this into the journalism they do. The influences around Desmond and what people have seen is a reflection of drag queen story time and the erasure of healthy boundaries between adults and children. No one is saying all drag queens who want to get into libraries are paedophiles, but how do we tell? Child abusers are naturally cunning in order to survive. Desmond is amazing, has been mixing in highly sexualized circles for several years since he came to prominence dancing at a pride parade. Certainly, there is a clear sexualization with Desmond and his parents have made him a vulnerable target to be lusted after by paedophiles and accessible to murderers. If any further proof were needed of how inappropriate Desmond's lifestyle is for a child and how he's being viewed by older men, people need look no further than former chairman of the Paedophile Information Exchange, Tom O'Carroll. O'Carroll is unashamedly a pro-paedophile activist. On his blog, he's a big fan of young Desmond, who, according to O'Carroll, is hot. An endorsement that would distress most caring parents. And yet such support and promotion of Desmond is encouraged by those who are supposed to protect him. And we thought our illegal um, interest in children ought to be made legal if... Uh, it concerned relations with uh, young people who were consenting to a relationship, if they were willingly involved. I mean, this is just horrible reading this. No wonder somebody like Desmond would appeal to a man like Tom O'Carroll. I mean, this is just a, a, the, the 21st century attempt at normalising paedophilia for the masses. I mean, O'Carroll writes, Let's face it, when a pretty young boy tells the world he is gay and dances sensuously in front of grown men wearing vampish dresses and makeup, when she strips off items of clothing or goes on stage scantily clad right from the off, when dollar bills are accepted as tips from an audience apparently wild with excitement, when all this is going on, we are getting far more than just a celebration of gender diversity or an innocent display of precocious performance talent. I feel sorry for this child. I am concerned for this child and any child who is put in the adult sphere of being a drag kid. So, despite local resistance and parents and teachers petitioning councils and even headlines in national newspapers, Drag Queen Storytime has, in 2020, progressed to some of the biggest institutions in the land. In February 2020, both the British Library and the Maritime Museum hopped on board the drag train, and with it, the added credibility of now being beyond question, seeing as Drag Queen Storytime has become part of the British establishment. In answer to criticism, the British Library responded by saying, The British Library is open to everyone and stands with those who oppose discrimination in all forms. Whoever penned this statement on behalf of England's foremost library presumably lacks knowledge of child safeguarding and refuses to accept that people have legitimately pointed out red flags. This explicit us against the world message that libraries are using to defend their decisions to host drag queens for children is straight out of an abuser's toolkit 101 and libraries are parroting drag queens in creating an us and them dynamic. I've watched Drag Queen Storytime from different countries. There's a running theme where drag queens tell the children that they are there despite the hatred. This psychologically bonds those present. This is a troubling message when there is genuine concern for Drag Queen Storytime that should not be written off lazily as just hate or discrimination. The culture is so strong on promoting this stuff. And here we are, and we have to have these kinds of discussions and people think, we're the problem because we're trying to stop the dominant culture or whatever. 
Nothing and no one should be above questions when it comes to the safety and protection of children, that children ages 3 to 11 have been deemed appropriate audiences for sexualized caricatures with confusing messages should not stop people raising objections through fear of being deemed a bigot or targeted for a backlash. Child safeguarding must be above that. <laughs>